Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I have for you part two of the video that I did dedicated to Rebecca by Alfred Hitchcock and in which I wanted to go over seven things that I had found out and I thought were very interesting to share here on the channel. And if you missed it, I'll leave a link down below of the previous video in which we covered some very interesting facts about the casting process of Rebecca, how Manderley, the mansion, was filmed and was built for the movie. Also, we talked about fashion and how these magnificent pieces of clothing are called in Spain. And last but not least, we also discussed how Rebecca could also be a fairy tale and how it could be viewed also as a twist of Cinderella and for today's video for part two I've got some very special people to talk about. We will discuss David of Selsnake, we will talk about Daphne du Maurier and the suspense will be will I be able to pull off pronouncing her surname several times in a row? Stay tuned! And lastly, I will talk about women that were very influential in Alfred Hitchcock's work. Some incredible women that I have recently discovered and that I have learned a bit about but that I so want to keep on learning about and that I'm so happy to be able to share here. So we've got quite a lineup for today's video. So the reason why I decided to make two videos instead of one for this topic was that as it usually happens, the topic had so much more depth than what I initially anticipated. So I decided to divide it into two videos so that it would be a bit more digestible. And it seemed also quite fitting because this week was also the release in Netflix of the new adaptation of Rebecca. So I won't extend anymore with this intro. I'll just leave you with the video with part two of the things that you probably must know about Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. So with no more ado, let's jump into it. Another thing that you have to know about 1940s Rebecca is the turbulent relationship between Alfred Hitchcock and David O. Selznick, who produced this movie and who brought Alfred Hitchcock from England to Hollywood. There's even a book dedicated to the topic of the relationship between Hitchcock and Selznick, which I will link down below, and also a documentary that it's available on YouTube and it really depicts very well what it was like to be a producer and what it was like to be a director in Hollywood's golden era, the studio system era, how producers at that time were far more important and really owned the movie so much more than the director of the film. And David O. Selznick is again another paradigmatic case of this situation. In those days, the name of producers were more often than not the name before the title. And again, there were in some aspects, in some senses, considered far more authors of a film than the director himself. Conversely, directors back in the day were not considered authors as we do today. I think that that's something that changed with Francis Nouvelle Vague and especially French critics started giving directors the role of an author. But back in the studio system era, that was certainly not the case. So very few directors had that status of an author, I would say. But as we know, Hitchcock was a very different filmmaker and it was certainly hard for him to comply with that system. By the end of the 1930s and 1940s, again, David O. Selznick was one of the most prominent producers, if not the most independent producers, that is, in Hollywood. He had been responsible for the contracts of artists that he brought to Hollywood and that he loaned to other studios. That was the case of Alfred Hitchcock, of Ingrid Berman, of Gene Kelly, 
of Vivian Lee, of John Fontaine, so quite a lot of enormous talent that he brought to Hollywood from different parts of the world, from different industries. He had definitely an eye for talent, but he was also very demanding, a very controlling producer, something that as you might imagine was not something that Alfred Hitchcock was enamored with. Certainly in terms of adapting a very popular book, he had very specific ideas. In this case, he wanted to be as faithful as possible to the original material and even in the way things were shot and depicted on the film as well, which is something that again Hitchcock clashed with because for him, being a director meant being the primary creative reference of the movie and he certainly enjoyed also working every aspect of the film from the script to the props and as I have talked in previous videos perhaps the least favorite part of the process for Hitchcock was the actual shooting of the movie he really enjoyed designing and devising how everything would be translated into film into motion picture and I've I'm quite certain that that was something that he didn't want to share control over. Another thing that is quite interesting to know about their relationship and how Hitchcock ended up in Hollywood is that initially David O. Selznick had brought him or contacted him to direct an adaptation of The Sinking of the Titanic. So the movie that Hitchcock was supposed to direct first in Hollywood was supposed to be a movie about the Titanic. So David O. Selznick ended up choosing Rebecca's adaptation to be the project for Alfred Hitchcock and I think that that was an excellent choice. It seems that Alfred Hitchcock had also been interested in the novel which was published in 1938 and he even tried to acquire the rights for the novel but they were too expensive for him, so David O. Selznick took over. So as you can imagine, lots of disagreements began during the making of Rebecca. If you watch the Hitchcock and Selznick documentary, there's a quote there from actor Norman Lloyd, who collaborated many, many times with Hitchcock, who says that Selznick and Hitchcock were like two sticks that together made fire. And I think that that's a very graphic and very good definition of how these two very powerful controlling men worked. But differences aside, egos clashing aside, theirs was a powerful collaboration and will forever be indebted to Selznick for bringing such talents to the big screen. Another connection that is worth exploring from Rebecca is the one between Daphne du Maurier and Alfred Hitchcock. As probably some of you know, this was not Alfred Hitchcock's first adaptation of a novel by du Maurier. The first adaptation was for 1939's Jamaica Inn, which was a British production, in fact his last British production before he went to Hollywood, although Rebecca, even though it was made in Hollywood, it was practically in many senses still a British production because so many of the people who made it possible were British. We have to say that Daphne was less than happy with Hitchcock being chosen as the director to adapt Rebecca and that's because she was so appalled by the movie Jamaica Inn and that's due mainly because Charles Lawton, who was the producer of the movie, requested lots of changes from the original book in order to enhance his character. So again, Daphne was less than happy with Hitchcock being the filmmaker chosen to adapt Rebecca, but it was too late for her because David O. Selznick had already acquired the rights, so she had to zip it up and just pray for the best and in this case it worked because Rebecca was a fantastic adaptation in my opinion and I think that both the British author and the British director truly complemented each other aside from Jamaica Inn and Rebecca. Hitchcock also adapted another 
of her stories for the movie The Birds, which is another of his finest and most popular movies, I'd say. Being a fan of short fiction as I am, I would love to read some of her shorter stories, such as The Birds or The Apple Tree or Kiss Me Again Stranger. And I think that most of them are horror stories, which is a very fascinating topic for me. I haven't watched, to be fair, that many horror movies, especially the classics is something that I would love to correct, but that's because film is such a powerful medium for me that anything I see and anything I hear, it just lingers on my mind. It's so difficult for me to erase that once I've seen it. So I get, again, overstimulated, if you will, with horror films and boy, I'm scared easily. But conversely, reading horror fiction, especially from Oscar Wilde, from Edgar Allan Poe, from Bram Stoker, from Mary Shelley. It has been such a rewarding experience for me. So I would love to read Daphne du Maurier's as well. But Daphne du Maurier and Hitchcock also had in common again their interest in gothic fiction and gothic ambience and a flair for the psychoanalytical elements more as a stylistic thing rather than as a therapy but it would be again fair to say that Daphne du Maurier was one of Hitchcock's favorite authors. Finally, what I wanted to point out as something interested that you really have to know about this movie is that aside from Daphne's work, there are two other women that I think are quite important to bring to your attention because they're two unusual, sadly, two unusual cases of women during the studio system. So I'll start by mentioning first Joan Harrison, whose name you can see in the writing credits of this movie. She was one of the screenwriters along with Robert Sherwood, who worked in the screenplay of Rebecca. And Joan has been quite a recent discovery for me. It just caught my eye when I was checking the cast and crew of Rebecca. And also through Twitter, I found out about Christina Lane, who is a film historian and critic who has recently published a book called Phantom Lady, specifically on Joan Harrison. And it is a book that I'm certainly very interested in reading. And that's because Joan Harrison basically started first as Hitchcock's secretary in 1933, but she quickly progressed and she started reading scripts and writing synopsis for Hitchcock and eventually started to write screenplays and be a member of the writing department. I believe her first writing credit was for Jamaica Inn and her second one was Rebecca's. She was a very talented young woman and she quickly started to gain more and more reputation and really from that moment on her career launched in Hollywood but as I've read she decided to become a producer and that's where her other great contribution to cinema started and also to television because she was a very prominent producer at a time when women did not have that role with the exception perhaps of Virginia Van Up and Harriet Parsons so it was a very unusual case of a woman having a producer role. Her first credit as an associate producer was for the movie called Phantom Lady which is quite a cult classic. It was directed by Robert Siodmak and it starred Francia Tone and Ella Raines. So as you can see, Phantom Lady is also the title of the book that Christina Lane has written about Joan Harrison. In 1944, she wrote and produced the movie Dark Waters. That is quite a fascinating movie, if you ask me. So as I was saying, during the 40s, she produced mystery and film noir movies at Universal. And then in the 50s, Alfred Hitchcock called her again to produce his famous TV series called Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which was later renamed as the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. So that is quite a legacy from a woman that's been mostly overlooked. And I, for one, would definitely love to continue investigating about Joan Harrison and her work and her legacy in mystery and film noir movies, which is a genre 
that is one of my favorites quite an exception sadly but someone that should be discussed a lot more another prominent woman that worked in this movie but whose work sadly is not credited is the illustrator and production designer Dorothea Holt Redmond she was an artist who was part of the David O. Selznick studio art department at a time when it was all a male dominated field that explained probably that her name is not properly credited in this movie or other movies that she worked in she was responsible in this case for creating the storyboards but it was not only a case of making drawings of the camera angles and the sequences her contribution was bringing the proper mood and the tone for each scene the lighting and the shadows her job was extremely important for Hitchcock who relied so much on this drawings and these illustrations to bring to life and to organize what he had in his mind so as you can see her job was outstanding and true works of art her most prominent collaborations with Alfred Hitchcock were in Rebecca Shadow of a Doubt Rope to Catch a Thief and The Man Who Knew Too Much her work it is said to have influenced Alfred Hitchcock with the German expressionist aesthetic that he is credited with it seems that it stems so much from Dorothea's work because she really set the tone for the cameraman and the lightning crew to establish the mood of the scene aside from Hitchcock she worked in more than 30 films ranging from Gone with the Wind the best years of our lives to the Ten Commandments Dorothea also worked later in an architectural firm and she was hired by none other than Walt Disney another visionary who had certainly a knife for talent and she helped design parts of Disneyland and the Walt Disney Resort and she is another woman that I would certainly love to know more about it is fascinating to know how much all these movies come from a tremendous group of people, a tremendous collaboration of some of the finest artists and technicians of their time and how important I think it is to remember them and to discover them and to investigate what they did. All right, so that was all for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that it was interesting. It certainly was for me to review all these aspects from Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. I hope that it entices you to watch the movie and read the novel if you can as well and I would love to know in the comments down below which one of these things was more interesting for you to learn and it would be also great to know if you are going to watch Netflix new adaptation but in any case again I hope that this is a chance also to look back to 1940s version which is I'd say truly fantastic and as always give this video a thumbs up if you liked it subscribe if you haven't already thank you so much for watching thank you so much for sharing the love for classic movies and again as always stay safe take care and see you all in my next video bye right Hitchcock so we're gonna like it up like dynamite, whoa